Coming up on this edition of CPS 360, we're visiting 9-11 through the eyes of a first responder, clicking into new technology for Columbia Public Schools, and we'll take a look back at some TV shows we grew up with. CPS 360 starts now. Welcome to this edition of CPS 360. I'm Jordan Miller. And I'm Sarah Miller. Ten years ago, the world responded as terrorists attacked our country. CPS 360 reporter Mahogany Thomas sat down with a career center teacher who went from Missouri to Mayhem that very day. Can you describe the exact feelings that rushed through your head when you received your third page? I was pretty scared, pretty nervous. Um, when the pager went off the third time and it said, you know, prepare, you're going to New York City, um, the previous two pager alerts and the two attacks, well, I knew we were being attacked when the two first two planes struck, so I knew when that third notification came through that we were going to New York, and I, I was pretty nervous, pretty scared, and kind of worried about what we were going to encounter when we got there. And can you explain New York City when you got there, when you arrived? What did it look like? What did it smell like? How, what were the people like? It just seemed like there was a lot of chaos. Um, people going in every direction. Um, let's see. You could feel the nervousness and the fear in the air. Um, you could smell burning fuel, burning you know, jet fuel, you could smell water, you could, you could smell all kinds of things that, that kind of the, the debris, the dust that was still there. So there was just this fear in the air and this, this sense of, again, I just unknown and this, these people just sitting there not knowing what to do. And so what was it like seeing all the death that was there at Ground Zero that you observed and how did that impact you? In my fire service career, I've been on a lot of calls, but you know, that there was death, and you, you know, you knew up front, but this one here, I mean, it was just so obvious that there was no one going to survive the call, and, and it, it just kind of stuck in your head for a long time, because I think you're trained to rescue people, firefighters and rescue personnel are trained to rescue, we weren't there to rescue anyone, we were there to, to recover bodies. How did you cover 9-11 this year in class? In my firefighting class, we've talked about safety and just overall safety in, in the fire service and what firefighters do to prepare. Uh, we talked about stress. So we talked about the stress that some of the people experienced after responding back from 9-11 and the, um, how it affected families and not only the individual, but also affected families in, in negative ways. So we've talked about it in our EMT classes and what to expect as far as responding. And, and ultimately, I told my students that you know, just because you're in mid-Missouri doesn't mean that you may not end up at a large-scale incident if another terrorist attack takes place. I never thought, I mean, originally being from New York City and living in Missouri, I never thought um, or imagined that I would return back to New York City while being an employee of the Columbia, Missouri Fire Department and a member of Missouri Task Force One to respond back to New York City to, to aid the New York City Fire Department and Police Department. Will you ever, or have you ever, visited Ground Zero again? I took my wife and, and kids to New York City um, a couple years after that, and we actually stayed at the Embassy Suites downtown near Ground Zero. Um, we haven't been since they've done the, the, the work there, but we plan on going here pretty soon. The United States will always remember 9-11. It forever changed our country and many of our lives. Unfortunately, tragedy is everywhere, but there are ways to minimize its effects. Here's Craig and Carbone with one. Seatbelt safety awareness is a big issue in America. Both Rockbridge and Hickman High Schools dedicate the entire month of October to seatbelt safety awareness. During this month, Modot sponsors the Battle of the Belts contest. All participating high schools do a surprise check at the beginning of the month and then again at the end of the month. The school that improves the most percentage of students wearing seatbelts wins. It's really important 
to make sure that everyone in the car has a seatbelt on. Obviously, we can't control what other people do, but we can encourage and try to get them to get their seatbelt on, too. It, it's really good if you're making the choice for yourself to buckle up, but um, you also want to encourage everyone in the car to have their seatbelts on so everyone's safe. It is reported that 63% of people killed in accidents were not wearing their seatbelts. When the saying, seatbelts save lives, is said, it's the truth. Two of our own Rockford students, Katie Rodriguez and Alexander Jones, can vouch for that. It was the first day of school and I went and Katie called me last minute for a ride into school because we were both excited for the first day of school. So I went in and we were, I picked her up early. Um, we were having a fun time in the car, just talking, enjoying ourselves. Um, we were going down Route K and uh, we decided to turn left on the old plank last second and we made a left turn and a big dump truck T-bone us going through. Incredibly, Alex walked away from the accident with nothing but minor scratches and bruises. Katie wasn't so lucky. Her major injuries included a concussion, a broken left ankle, right shin, right femur, broken nose, and a fractured hip in three places. She had one major surgery, it was like four to, four to five, six hours, and it went uh, better than expected, which was really great because things could have been a lot worse. It could have been a lot worse. Luckily, both Alex and Katie were wearing their seatbelts, which ultimately saved both their lives. For CPS 360, I'm Craig and Carbone. Thanks, Craig, and now here's Matt Weatherford with a download on the new Columbia Public Schools computer network. For most students, the new year started off smoothly. That is until they started logging onto the computers. But that's only because a lot of information has changed. Other than that, it has been a smooth transition to the Windows 7 operating system. I think it's great. I think everything that we're doing so far has just been really great. Uh, it's keeping us more in the mainstream and so students have more of this technology at home. So we're keeping up and I think it's great. <laughs> in addition to Windows 7, YouTube and Twitter are now available to students. It just makes sense to be able to allow students that same access uh, when they're trying to do research for different projects and presentations. So you may ask yourself, why did Columbia Public Schools unblock Twitter and YouTube? Murphy says because both sites can be used for educational purposes. Now teachers and students have the same access to technology. For CBS 360, I'm Matt Weatherford. Not only did computer changes occur, Rockford students had to deal with a new schedule change policy. Laura Crisfield takes a look at the new procedure. During the first few days of school, students have the chance to experience their new schedule. When the third day rolls around, the chaos begins, especially in the guidance office. You know, we just expect it. I mean, we know that students are going to want to come in. And I personally enjoy that because it gives me an opportunity to see lots of my kids. So um, I can't always make them happy, but just to have the opportunity to, to talk with them a little bit, I like that. And yeah, it, it is kind of hectic, and it, it was busy those first couple of days. The new system requires that students go to their first two days of classes before requesting schedule changes. I think everybody's fairly happy. I mean, there's some students maybe that didn't get everything that they wanted, but they're okay with it. Junior Allison Rybrick has a different opinion. She was unable to change her schedule to get the classes she wanted. I was frustrated because I think that if someone really wants to take a class, they should be willing to make room, like bring in an extra desk. I don't think it should be that big of a deal. Changing schedules was also difficult as very few classes had openings. Students were frustrated that even when changing their schedules, they weren't able to receive their first or even their second choice of class. Core classes were especially hard to change. The counselor told me to come in that Monday to, to just switch to AP after school started. And um, I went in and after waiting like over an hour in the morning, um, I got in and I spent about 15 seconds in there and she told me that the class was full so I couldn't switch in AP. The guidance counselors understand the frustration, but they also have a proposed solution. We talked with our students last year about really taking time um, to be thoughtful about their course selections and really think about um, you know, the career path and what classes that they really wanted to take. Next year, guidance will stress the importance of picking classes wisely, especially alternates. For CPS 360, I'm Laurel Critchfield. Now imagine a completely different kind of change. Walking into a new, unfamiliar high school for the first time, Shelby Smith reports on how Rockridge reaches out to new students. When you walk the halls of Rockridge, it can be intimidating, especially for a new student. 
The Ambassador Club was established to help these students. It gives me a really good opportunity to get to know the new kids and to kind of learn the building a little bit more. <coughs> and I just like helping other people. The program is organized solely at the convenience of the new student and their ambassador's schedules. When a new student is enrolling, uh, I will send out an email to all the ambassadors to see if anybody's available to give a tour at whatever time works for that other student. Sierra Bryant is a new student from Georgia. She says the Ambassador Club is a great idea, but unfortunately she had to yet to meet her new ambassador. I was never contacted by anybody and I ended up getting lost on my first day and I was late to the majority of my classes. The Ambassador Club is relatively new. Mr. Mattenberg says it's a work in progress. For CPS 360, I'm Shelby Smith. While new students find their way around, existing students are lost. Kaylee Wilson explains as she provides a glimpse at a structural change happening at Hickman. At Hickman High School, improvements are always underway. Whether it's the drama department, art programs, or even the parking lot, things are constantly changing. But this year, special attention is being paid to the athletic and educational classroom structure. We're building a new gymnasium, and along with that, we're building a new vocational area which will encompass a welding shop, a wood shop, the marketing area, and then there are some additional classrooms that will not be totally completed in this first bond issue uh, project that are additional spaces for when the new high school opens so that we can have some, a variety of other vocational classes. While the building is under construction, teachers and students are also making adjustments. If you are familiar with our classroom setup, our welding shop, where the whole horticulture area, I think animal sciences, that area which was the 101, 101A area, 102 which was our wood shop area is being taken down. The marketing area which was 103 area and there were several other classes in there and then classroom 104, those are all being taken out so that we can then put the new building in those, in this footprint of those areas. With staff resorting to parking on the tennis courts and multiple classes displaced, the big question is, when will all of this construction be completed? They'll start sometime after the fall seasons are over with, um, I guess what you call tearing out the old and then it'll be about 18 months so somewhere in that May, June, July of 2013 prior to the 13-14 school year mm -hmm. when we have all the freshmen and the new high school opens that's the target time for it to be finished. Administration, teachers, and students are all being cooperative and they promise that it will definitely pay off. For CPS 360, I'm Kaylee Wilson. Students from Hickman are becoming better writers every day. Tierney Morales goes behind the scenes at Hickman High School. Future writers come together every day to create Hickman's purple and gold blog. Located on Hickman's homepage, students blog about movies, current events, and many other topics. I mean, there's really something for everybody. The students' hard work make the purple and gold block as good, if not better, than past years. Everyone works really hard and does a really great job of getting their blogs done. The blog gives students a fun place to let their inner writer shine. The point of a blog is more to be kind of, you know, showcase writing skills and that sort of thing and have, like, you know, your voice show through. So check out the Purple and Gold blog and see what the buzz is all about. For CPS 360, I'm Tierney Morales. Athletics are a big part of high school, but not all fans see beyond the game. Here's Harry Schauwecker, who takes a look at the dollars and cents of sports. It's no secret that Columbia Public Schools is faced with tough choices when it comes to budget issues. Every program is taking a hit, including athletics. Athletics, as a, as a district athletics, gets a chunk of money, then that money is split among 
the high schools and the junior highs and no longer the middle schools because they don't have interscholastic athletics. So that's how we get our budget money, which um, has been cut so much in the last several years. It pretty much just covers travel, uh, registration costs, and uh, officials. So one of the areas struggling to be funded is team uniforms. Historically, you wouldn't think cross country would need lots of money. Well, they need lots of money because they've got to outfit all of these kids. Um, you know, their only real expense is travel, uh, registration fees, and, and uniforms. And we struggle to keep them in uniforms because there's so many kids. Some athletes at Rockbridge feel as if some programs, like football, get more than their fair share of funding. I feel like football gets a lot of unneeded money because, I mean, how many state championships have they won in the last, in the last like, two years? Or how, many, how, how close have they got? You know, like cross country, we got second in state last year, and we have, the, we have all the necessary assets to get to, uh, get to a state championship this year. So I feel like the funding for football is just, um, uh, football compared to cross country is just kind of skewed based on, um, performance at each level. Rockbridge football coach A.J. Afadale disagrees. I think relative to the cost of actually having a football team and also relative to the revenue that football draws, I would say we're actually maybe smaller than what we should be based on, uh, you know, our, our athletic director does a phenomenal job of making sure all the programs are supported. And so, um, you know, we like to operate, especially as a program, um, under the, the idea that we're no more important than anybody else and that if we have to tighten our belt a little bit to help another program be productive, then we're willing to do that. But um, I would say compared to other programs, compared to the, the actual sheer cost of equipment and helmets and the sheer numbers, I would say we're probably a little underfunded compared to some of the other programs. Ms. Mast confirms that all sports at Rockbridge are funded fairly. So we want to fund everyone to a sufficient level um, to do what they need to do. Um, that means if girls golf needs more, we need to get them more, but they wouldn't need the same amount as football. Whether you play football or run cross country, it's safe to say that the funding for your sport will come up short. For CPS 360, I'm Harry Schalacher. We all remember our favorite TV shows growing up, but have you stopped to think about the impact that show has on your life? Landon Fitzpatrick did, and this is what he discovered. It might not surprise you that 99% of American households have at least one TV set. What might surprise you is the amount of minutes that the average American child spends watching TV, which is a little over 1,500 minutes per week, which boils down to four hours a day. So the question is asked, do these minutes hinder or help a child's development? They learn everything. Children are like sponges, so absolutely. What they saw on television, what I tried to keep them from, uh, from television, all had a part in shaping who they are. Okay. Overfelt isn't saying it's good or bad, just that television has a profound influence on those watching. My mom happens to agree. I believe that kids learn what they live, and if they are sitting in front of the TV watching it, they're going to learn and pick up language and their demeanor could change, their, their attitudes, definitely. Growing up is a part of life, and many high school students would agree what they watched as they matured made them the person they are today. They always taught me to just like have fun and stuff and just kind of be, just be kind of an easygoing person that I am. I loved Saved by the Bell. I always wanted to be like A.C. Slater. Um, you know, I love the, the bright colors and everything. But does today's youth programming prompt maturity too soon? I think a lot of the shows, even on Disney Channel, they're a lot more, like, I feel like that's appropriate for younger kids just because, like, they bring in stuff like boys and girls and dating. And sometimes even on Disney Channel, they'll be, like, kissing or something. And I'm just like, I mean, the people who are six and seven are watching this. Like, I don't know. I would definitely rather them be exposed to real-life situations because eventually you're going to have to deal with that anyway. I think everything has to have a balance, though. The TV is not meant to raise our kids. The parents should be doing that. Whether you watched Full House, Saved by the Bell, or all that, one thing we all can agree upon is the shows that we watched yesterday influence our personalities today. For CPS 360, I'm Marion Fitzpatrick. <gasps> 
We lost two of our close friends this year. Let's take a moment to remember them. Thanks for watching CPS 360. I'm Jordan Miller. And I'm Sarah Miller. See you next month. Yo, what's up, CBS 360? This is Will I Am.